To grasp the significance of this discovery, we need to transfer ourselves back to an era when the only way to learn about the inside of a human body was by dissecting it. A discovery that kickstarted the field of medical imaging and an era of atomic physics. Today, we'll talk about the research that was awarded the first Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901, the discovery of X-ray by Wilhelm Röntgen. Wilhelm was born on March 27, 1845 in Lennep, Germany. He was a single child of a wealthy cloth merchant. And three years after his birth, the family moved to the Dutch city of Appledoon. Based on my reading, I found him to be very curious and explorative in his early days. Although not too academically inclined, he had a very strong character and a moral compass. Here's an interesting story. In 1862, he was expelled from his technical school in Utrecht for laughing at a caricature of a strict professor, which he had not drawn. But he decided not to give the name of the student who did. Pretty solid guy, right? On top of that, when applying for University of Utrecht, he had to take an oral exam. And guess who was the examiner? It was the same professor whose caricature he had laughed at. We can guess, of course, he didn't get the admit. So when he came to know about a school which did not require a technical diploma in Zurich, the Zurich Polytechnical School, he decided to join the Mechanical Technical Division there. He left Utrecht on November 16, 1865. He loved the mountains of Zurich and would frequently go on hikes and also had a favorite spot to eat at a local inn. And the innkeeper's daughter, who was also a waitress there, Anna Ludwig, caught his eye. In university, he thrived. His grades kept improving as the courses progressed while also taking additional courses at the adjacent University of Zurich. And in his last year, he achieved the highest possible marks. August 6, 1868, he received his degree in mechanical engineering and on the same day, he proposed to Anna. After graduation, he stayed at the University of Zurich. He developed a great liking for theoretical physics while working with Professor August Kund, and under him he wrote a dissertation study on gases which earned him a PhD on June 22, 1869. After that, August invited him to work as an assistant together at the University of Wurzburg in Germany, which is also where he got married to Bertha in 1872. However, they would not let him be a private docent because of his history in Utrecht and also discounted his PhD. A private docent is an academic position like an internship, which is an important step towards being a professor. So there was a new university in Strasbourg getting established with much less restrictions where August was called and Wilhelm joined him. After clearing an exam there, he finally got the title of private docent. He decided to pursue a different opportunity for a while, but since he didn't enjoy the work there, August happily welcomed him back to the University of Strasbourg. They continued to work together up until 1879, which is when Willem was offered the position of Chair of Physics at Giesen University. By the end of his tenure at Giesen, he had already published more than 30 papers and 18 of them were while working at Giesen University. Later, he accepted a position at the University of Wurzburg in 1888, the same place that didn't allow him to be a private docent. So it's a full circle. This is where he would discover X-rays. After his discovery, he would go on to become Chair of Physics and Director of Physical Institute at University of Munich. And that would be his last professional experience. There were a lot of crucial milestones that were achieved which served as a stepping stone for Röntgen's success. In late 19th century, scientists were exploring the properties of electricity and magnetism a lot. And one of the experimental traditions that was followed was the study of discharge of electricity in gases or vacuum. And people had been creating electrical discharging gases long back since 1700s. And the way to do that is a simple setup where we have basically a glass vessel or a tube with electrodes on two ends that are connected to a power supply that creates a potential difference between a cathode and an anode. Cathode being the negatively charged electrode and anode being the positively charged electrode. The progress in experimentation and its results depended mainly on two things. Number one, the ability to produce high voltage differences and second, the ability to create vacuum. And both of these areas would improve with time and the progress is kind of interlinked because even if you create low pressure or high vacuum, somehow you won't be able to do the experiment without being able to create high voltages, which would be formulated later as Paschen's law. And it basically states that at lower pressure, the minimum voltage required to generate a spark across two electrodes would increase as we decrease the pressure. When it comes to producing high voltage power, that was only possible after the invention of electromagnet by William Sturgeon in 1825 and Michael Faraday's discovery of electromagnetic induction in 1831. After which, Nicholas Callan and Charles Grattan independently yet simultaneously built the first induction coil in 1836. Now, this, unlike batteries that produce continuous steady current, instead produced an interrupted current of much higher potential. A decade after that, in the 1850s, is when 
Hendrik Rumkoff started manufacturing this induction coil and got a patent in 1851, which came to be known as the Rumkoff induction coil. By the end of the decade of 1830s, we knew many things from the discharge experiment, such as William Watson would find that the flow of charges through gases increased as the pressure was lowered and that it was electric current itself. Martinus Merum would discover that the spark discharges at atmospheric pressure exhibited different colors depending on the gases used. Charles Wheatstone identified that the discharge was not continuous but rapid succession of intermittent discharges and Michael Faraday, while experimenting through a lot of rarefied gases, showed that as the amount of air decreased, a faint glow between the electrodes can be seen. And the glow in discharge wasn't continuous but separated into bright regions near the electrode and dark regions in the middle which would be named as Faraday dark space. After this, however, not much would happen as we couldn't go further in terms of producing higher vacuum. And also the Rumkoff induction coil would start manufacturing and distribution after 1850s. Let's quickly understand the experiment first. Although it might not be exact in terms of the setup historically, it is important to know. At low pressures of around 40 mm mercury or 40 torr, we start seeing sparking effect inside the tube. After that, if we lower it even more to around 10 mm mercury, we see that the stream broadens and a positive column develops along with a dark space called Faraday dark space. At 6 mm mercury, we see that a short column develops near the cathode. And at 3 mm mercury, we see that the positive column has developed clearer striations. So as we caught up on the experiment and results of Michael Faraday, the experiment's second dependency, the ability to generate lower pressures, would play an even more crucial role. You see, before 1850s, evacuated chambers were created by pumping out gas using bars, which were then closed each time. And as you can see, the lowest pressure we achieved was 0.4 inches mercury or 1 torr. So making observations lower than that didn't happen until Geisler, a glass blower who in 1857 built a mercury based vacuum pump that was more efficient in evacuating gases. After he got a request from Plucker to build a discharge tube, he decided to use the pump to build an evacuated and sealed glass tubes this time. And the sealed nature of this made it even more convenient to conduct experiments. Now, Julius Plucker and Geisler collaborated on many experiments moving forward. However, Geisler was more interested in different colors, different gases would produce in a tube and selling these tubes, which came to be known as Geisler's tube. While Plucker was more interested in learning about the stripes and if there were effects of external forces on the cathode rays. And he was the first to identify that the cathode rays can be deflected by a magnet. If you lower the pressure even more, what you observe is that the dark space completely occupies the tube. Now, Plucker had a graduate student named Hitoff who would identify improvement in the Geisler's pump that allowed to create even lower pressure. He discovered that the rays were coming from cathode, hence calling them cathode rays. He also discovered that the rays travel in a straight line and produce shadows when a metal was placed in front of them. And when a cathode ray strikes the glass surface, it causes it to fluoresce. Crookes, a British researcher, also after help from his assistant Gingham, would create low pressure tubes and produce similar results. He conducted the famous Maltus cross experiment to prove cathode rays travel in a straight line and cause the fluorescent effect. However, Hitoff believed that the rays were UV rays, but Crookes didn't agree and sided with the fact that they were charged particles as they would get deflected by a magnet and because of the fact that they did not pass through materials that are transparent to UV rays. He also conducted the famous paddle wheel experiment in which he demonstrated that a paddle wheel would travel from cathode to anode if placed inside the tube concluding that the rays had momentum like a particle. So there were two camps of thoughts developing, the British favoring a stream of particle as the theory and those on the continent preferring to think of them as some sort of disturbance of the ether like UV rays. Hendrik Hertz was in the other camp and wanted to prove that they were not particles. He observed that the cathode rays could pass through thin foils of gold, silver, or aluminium. So he asked his pupil Leonard to continue the work, who then constructed a vacuum tube with a thin aluminium foil window at one end which came to be known as the Leonard's tube and demonstrated again that the cathode rays penetrated the aluminum window and traveled a few centimeters. The induced fluorescence for eight centimeters and electric charge or ionizing effect until 30 centimeters. The ionizing effect, however, until 30 centimeters was due to X-rays that were generated and not the cathode rays. He also experimented by enclosing the tube in a metal jacket, keeping the window exposed. However, this might have only caused absorption of the soft X-rays that were generated towards the side. Along with that, he also passed cathode rays through sheet of cardboard and in this case he observed no fluorescence but darkening of photographic material was occasionally seen. He did not explain why this was happening though. Even crooks would experience fogging of unused photographic plates that were lying near his equipment but he sent them back to the manufacturer assuming that they were defective. 
Now, Leonard was also using ketones subsequently with calcium sulfide phosphor to detect the results, both of which had low atomic number and hence didn't respond well to X-rays but only to cathode rays. Röntgen, as we'll see later, would start by using plantinocyanide. And interestingly, some sources say that Hertz had plantinocyanide available, but Leonard didn't have access to it. So it could be concluded that there were many reasons why Leonard or other researchers didn't discover X-rays, mainly ignored observations along with using wrong apparatus or just not repeating the experiment again when the technology had improved. So what are roughly the properties of cathode rays that we know so far? Number one, they travel in a straight line. Number two, they do not pass through materials with normal thickness like a metal cross or a cardboard and cast shadows. Number three, they are deflected by magnetic field. And number four, they can pass through thin sheets of specific metal of approximately 0.0026 cm, after which causing a fluorescence up to 8 cm and an ionizing effect up to 30 cm. Now, by now, many scientists have gotten conflicting results about particle versus ether theory. And Röntgen was captivated by the works of Hittoff, Crookes, Hertz, and Leonard. So, of course, he first started by getting his hands on the Rumkoff induction coil, multiple Crookes tubes, Leonard's tube, and Rapp's vacuum pump to evacuate the tubes for more efficiency. When Röntgen asked Leonard where he could get his hands on aluminum sheet, Leonard sent two of his own that were available on May 7, 1894. Some sources also say Röntgen was waiting for his ketone sheet to arrive, which was the reason why he started experimenting using barium platinocyanide. What he observed was ketone fluoresced only when placed near the window of Leonard's tube and not in any other position, unlike barium platinocyanide. He tried to recreate different types of scenarios that were previously performed using Crookes and Leonard's tube, including how Leonard performed the experiment in a dark room, also covering up the tube in a black cardboard. It was on November 8, 1895, while experimenting with Crookes tube from the corner of his eye, he observed that a screen of barium platinocyanide far from the tube gave off light when the tube was in operation. It was at a distance more than previously recorded 8 cm, so he realized that this required his undivided attention and Röntgen spent next 6 weeks in his lab, sometimes slept on the couch in the lab and rarely took out time to eat. He held objects like paper and book in front of the ray and saw very little dimming effect, and even noticed shadow of his bones. He continued to examine all kinds of objects from shotgun to wood and even mentioned attempts to take a photograph through a door to discover light stripes on the exposed plate. Upon dismantling the door, he found stripes of white lead that held the panel of the door together, causing such exposure. He got so immersed that his wife got upset when he didn't compliment her on the food that she'd prepared, and he did not even notice that she was angry until she confronted him. So excited about his discovery, he invited her down to the lab to show his work, and later he would also perform an exposure of her hand. This was the first recorded human X-ray, a fuzzy picture of a hand with a ring on it. Pretty romantic, right? After concluding his major observations, he delivered his historic paper named On a New Kind of Ray on December 28, 1895 to the Würzburg Physical Medical Society. He outlined 17 points as essential properties of these rays. And we'll be going over some of them, so if anyone's interested in publishing their own papers, they can get a reference of one of the most concise papers ever published. The first point quickly tells us about the setup of the experiment and its results. It reads, a discharge from a large induction coil is passed through Hittoff's vacuum tube or through a well-exhausted Crookes or Leonard's tube. The tube is surrounded by a fairly close-fitted shield of black paper. It is then possible to see in a completely darkened room that the paper covered on the side of barium platinocyanide lights up with brilliant fluorescence when brought near the neighborhood of the tube, whether the painted side or the other side be turned towards the tube. The fluorescence is still visible at 2 meters distance. It is easy to show that the origin of fluorescence lies within the vacuum tube. This next couple of points mention how different objects, the density and thickness affect the shadow on the plate. For example, here he mentions, it is readily shown that all bodies possess the same transparency but in varying degrees. A single thickness of tin foil hardly casts a shadow on the screen. Several have to be superposed to produce a marked effect. Glass plates of similar thickness behave similarly. Lead glass is, however, much more opaque than a glass free from lead. Water and several other fluids are very transparent. The preceding experiment led to the conclusion that the density of the bodies is the property whose variation mainly affects their permeability. But that the density alone does not determine the transparency is shown by an experiment wherein plates of similar thickness of Iceland spark, glass, aluminium and quartz were employed as screens. Then the Iceland spark showed itself much less transparent than the other bodies, though of approximately same density. He continues to give more evidence for the same in the next couple of points. After that, he talks about other bodies that exhibit fluorescence such as calcium sulfide, uranium glass, Iceland spa, rock, salt and the fact that photographic dry plates are sensitive to x-rays and we do not need to conduct the experiment in darkness. 
After that, he also tested if the X-rays can be deflected, refracted and reflected and he did not find any such effects. After that, he talks about the work of Leonard that has shown that cathode rays belong to ether and that X-rays are similar, basically saying X-rays are waves. But now we know that the prior is not true and the cathode rays are charged particles or electrons. Rangan then talks about the intensity of fluorescent light varying depending on inverse square of the distance between the screen and the discharge tube. In point number 11, he makes an even more notable distinction. He says that he has not succeeded in observing any deviation of X-rays in presence of very strong magnetic field, which is an important property of cathode rays and has been noted multiple times by Hertz and Leonard. In point number 12, he talks about the origin of X-rays within the discharge tube and states, as the result of many researches, it appears that the place of most brilliant phosphorescence of the wall of the discharge tube is the chief seat whence the X-ray originates and spreads in all direction. That is, X-ray proceeds from the front where the cathode ray strikes the glass. If one deviates the X-ray within the tube by the means of magnet, it is seen that X-ray proceeds from a new point that is again the end of the cathode rays. He then states that these cannot be considered as cathode rays that have just passed through the glass as the properties of deflection by a magnet wouldn't change, hence concluding that X-rays are not identical to cathode rays but are produced from cathode rays at the glass surface of the tube. However, now we know that X-rays are mainly produced by sudden deceleration or deflection of electron or cathode rays as they interact with a metal or an anode. Then he also attached photo of the first X-ray performed on a human, that of his wife's hand, and an X-ray of a compass. In the final point, to remove any ambiguity, he differentiates X-ray from UV rays by stating four key properties of X-ray that do not match with UV rays, and states that X-ray do not refract in passing from air into water, carbon bisulfide, aluminum, rock salt, glass, or zinc. They are incapable of regular reflection at surfaces of the above bodies. They cannot be polarized by any ordinary polarizing media and the absorption by various bodies must depend chiefly on their density. After the paper was released, no lectures or meetings were held until the end of Christmas. Rangan waited until January 23rd, 1896 to speak publicly on his discovery for the first and the last time. However, the word about his discovery traveled very fast to Europe and America even before the local newspaper in Würzburg had printed it. You see, after the discovery, Rangan had sent reprints of the paper and X-ray images to some of his close friends to avoid spread of misinformation. This included Professor Exner, who then, during a gathering with scientists, shared it with another Professor Ernst, who then shared the information with his dad, who was a publisher in press. So the news got published and was quickly adapted by other continental publishers. And on the evening of January 6, 1896, it was telegraphed from London to the countries of the world, garnering even more press. And this sudden publicity wasn't something Rangan welcomed that easily due to his modest nature. And the earlier reports were sent out without his consent. So it's kind of understandable. There were meetings held by a medical society discussing about its usefulness. New York Times announced the discovery on January 16th as transformation of modern surgery by enabling the surgeons to detect the presence of foreign bodies. This happened even before Rangan officially spoke on January 23rd, 1896. And the room was packed during this event. Rangan shared his story about how the rays were coming from a carefully covered tube, about his accidental discovery and the different objects he had tested. He performed a live demonstration on an anatomist, Von Kolliker, who after the demo applauded and proposed to call the rays Rangan rays. Within a month of announcement, doctors were finding practical applications of X-ray and using them to locate bullet in human flesh and broken bones. A doctor in Germany used it to diagnose sarcoma. In May, one doctor used it to locate bullet in forearm of two soldiers. Dr. Henry Catwell mentioned in New York Times, the surgical imagination can pressurably lose itself in devising endless application of this wonderful process. Doctors were photographing their brain, human heart, and soon we would see X-ray used to treat cancer. There were exhibitions held to show live demonstration of X-ray. More than 50 books were published in a year. Cartoons, poems, all kinds of publications were seen in newspaper. However, even though fascinated, some people were cautious and considered images of bones scary or such practices an invasion of privacy. For example, one of the published articles read, the consequence of which appears to be that you can see other people's bones with naked eye and also see through eight inches of solid wood. On the revolting indecency of this, there is no need to dwell. Perhaps the best thing would be for all civilized nations to combine to burn all works on Rangan Ray, to execute all the discoverers, and to corner all the tungsten in the world and whelm it in the middle of the ocean. Let the fish contemplate each other's bones if they like, but not us. An example of a poem is also on your screen. Feel free to pause the video and read it. It is hilarious in the hindsight. 
some firms started preying on women by advertising and selling clothing that would be x-ray proof under clothing there was also a law made in new jersey prohibiting use of x-rays in theaters now the good and the hopeful people were a lot more though and this would all fade away due to the radical application of this technology So you can see there are many fake stories or misleading stories published in the history of physics as well. Just like any history, it's difficult to find legitimate sources. And it can very well happen that the sources I'm currently referring to are not the accurate ones. And there is more context that needs to be added. However, some of these could be misleading in terms of the setup of experiment or crediting the discoverer, which we should be careful about. One such fake story was that it wasn't Röntgen, but his lab assistant who made the discovery attempting to discredit Röntgen's work. And it would actually disappoint him that people would accuse him like that. And we do know that is not true due to the testimony of his relatives. About the setup of the experiment, although less harmful, there would be a story that how it wasn't barium platinum cyanide that was giving off X-ray in a distance, but there was a book with a key in it that had an exposure on a photographic plate leading to the discovery of X-ray. However, this is also not true as Rangan himself shared and confirmed the actual story. Let's talk about controversies. As we looked at before, Röntgen wasn't the first to produce X-rays and a lot of researchers looking back would realize that. Crooks would send an apology letter to the manufacturer to whom he sent back all those defective plates. Leonard would not be able to take this gracefully though. Initially, he was very accepting and appreciative in his letter saying that even his own work got spotlight due to Röntgen's discovery. However, he would address this later by saying he was expecting Röntgen to reply back, praising and owing his discovery to Leonard's tube. Since this happened afterwards, some people say that the animosity started only after 1901 when Röntgen won the Nobel Prize. He accused Röntgen saying he is someone who stole his discovery. Leonard believed himself to be the discoverer of X-ray and would also start spreading this information. And when he won the Nobel Prize in 1905, in his acceptance speech, he tried to minimize the achievement of Röntgen by saying, The discovery of X-ray by Röntgen, the first one to use Leonard's tube, is generally cited as a good example of discovery by accident. But given the tube, it seemed to me at this stage of development, the discovery would follow inevitably. He also said, I am the mother of X-rays. Just as a midwife is not responsible for mechanism of birth, so was Röntgen not responsible for the discovery of X-ray, which merely fell into his lap. All Röntgen had to do was push a button since all the groundwork had been prepared by me. However, we know both Crookes and Leonard's tube can generate X-rays and would give same results for most experimental setup. He would also stop calling them X-ray or Röntgen days and instead call them high-frequency radiations. And there would also be political perspective that would influence his belief. But Röntgen didn't wish to reciprocate with the same animosity and mainly disagreed with him philosophically. Leonard would continue to harm the reputation of Röntgen. And the funny part is, Nobel Prize Committee recommended to award Nobel Prize to both Röntgen and Leonard. 29 proposals were submitted, 12 suggested Röntgen alone, 5 suggested both of them and 1 suggested Leonard. However, the Academy overrode the decision to give said Nobel Prize and this information would be released after 70 years and Leonard would pass away without knowing about it. There is no doubt that Röntgen was a great experimenter with extreme precision. And for a person like that, it is very difficult for an outcome of an experiment to go unnoticed. And his genius also lies in realizing how significant that observation was while others ignored it. All the attention that he received would certainly weigh on him and he would go on a vacation far from all the fame. After coming back, he would continue to work for a while on X-ray and published another set of results on March 10th, 1897 under the title, Further Observations on Properties of X-ray. Even with all the fame that he received, he never tried to capitalize on his finding or patented his discovery. He gave away the gold and some of his honorary medals to the government during the time of war. While his last tenure at University of Munich, he felt fulfilled at his work and personal life. However, after his wife would pass away, he felt really lonely and unhappy, especially during the time of his illness. He would pass away due to cancer on February 20, 1923. His work, however, would shine through generations to come, a discovery that revolutionized medicine. I hope you enjoyed. Stay tuned for more such stories and thank you so much for watching.